apologies, sir. No one respects you. It's all fun and games until somebody busts out the Rancor. The Book of Boba Fett Episode 3 deepens this whole Crime Lord mess that Boba Fett's gotten himself into with clearer answers on who's really running Mos Espa behind the scenes. Directed by Robert Rodriguez, this episode continues to set up what should be an epic conflict between powerful factions on the desert world of Tatooine, and we'll break all of that down, plus some cool guest stars and Easter eggs all over the place. So if you haven't seen Episode 3 yet, or you just don't want to hear about it, now would be the time to hop in your speeder and start a very medium speed chase through the heart of town. We do not want to be taken advantage of by paying protection to both. Okay, now that we're past the spoiler warning, let's get to the big takeaways from this episode. To answer the headline question right off the bat, the Pikes are the ones who seem to be really running things in Mos Espa, no matter how much Boba Fett likes to strut around town to remind everybody that he's the daimyo or whatever. In a flashback, we find out the Nikto speeder bike gang murdered Boba's Tusken Raider friends, and then back in the present, Boba gets his butt kicked by Black Chrysanthemum, the Wookiee bounty hunter is working for the twins, Jabba the Hutt's cousins, who bail on the whole conflict almost immediately before gifting Boba Fett with a baby Rancor, which is adorable, and then Boba Fett announced that he totally intends to ride that thing, which is awesome. Okay, that's a lot to dump on you all at once, so let's recap real quick. The episode kicks off with Lorth Appeal, played by Stephen Root, aka Milton from Office Space, and Bill Doe Tree from King of the Hill, showing up at the palace, formerly known as Jabba's, to petition Boba Fett to take out a cybernetically enhanced speeder bike gang who've been giving him the business lately. Or not enough business, rather. More on them in a minute, because Lorth Appeal does not seem to have any respect for Boba Fett, the crime lord. Anyway, he makes the case that since Bib Fortuna's death, the streets of Mos Espa have fallen to chaos, and if Boba Fett wants people to know he runs this town, he should actually be, you know, running it. Sophie Thatcher and her gang of cool kid cyborgs make their debut, and though she isn't named in this episode, even in the credits, some fans think that she bears more than a passing resemblance to Arden Lynn, the character created for 1997's underrated gem of a fighting game, Masters of the Terras Kasi. Hey, look, they both have robot arms. I get it. Anyway, sorry to burst your bubble, but IMDb lists her character as Drash. Could that be short for Drash Rendar? Maybe? No? Sorry. Anyway, Drash slash not Arden Lynn hangs out with these guys who, as Lortha warned, all have cybernetic upgrades made from droid parts. Boba Fett confronts the punks who explain Moss Espa Milton's been price gouging and that there's not enough work to afford his water, so Boba Fett hires them to join his entourage and pays off the water broker who can just go ahead and move his desk downstairs into storage B because mm, that'd be great, okay? All of this eventually leads Boba's gang back to the mayor's office, and while his squirrely majordomo tries to box them out, it's eventually made clear the Athorian Mokshaiz is simply not there, and the majordomo tries to make a run for it. They eventually chase down the majordomo and force him to reveal that the mayor works at the behest of the Pikes, those fishy guys from episode 2's train heist, who already have plenty of reasons to take exception to Boba Fett's claim to the title of Daimyo. <laughs> Remember the twins, Jabba the Hutt's cousins, who made a huge flex in the middle of town in episode 2? Well, hope you're ready for some whiplash, because by the end of this episode, they've reversed their position completely. Let me back up. The twins send their Wookiee henchman, Black Chrysanthemum, to attack Boba while he's taking a nice back to bubble bath. And look, there's really no way to be gentle about it. Chrysanthemum absolutely wipes the floor with Boba, but then the Gamorreans and Scooter Punks and Fennec Shan come to his rescue, and the Wookiee gets temporarily dropped into the Rancor pit, which is still currently lacking of a Rancor. We'll come back to him in a minute. Shortly after that, the twins show up to apologize for the assassination attempts and to explain that they're bowing out of this turf war entirely and heading back to Nal Hutta, since apparently the mayor promised Moss Espa to another crime family that the Huts don't want to get involved with. We now know that that's the Pikes, and it should give us a hint how scary they are if two Huts don't want to mess with them. As a parting gift, the twins leave Boba a brand new pet Rancor, as well as its very own Rancor Whisperer, played by the legendary Danny Trejo. This new Machete Malakili tells Boba that Rancor are usually well-behaved and can be very loyal to whoever they imprint upon, so they take off its blinders to make it think that Boba is its mama, and Boba is like, teach me to ride this Rancor, and if this show doesn't actually give us Boba Fett riding on a Rancor, I'm giving up on Star Wars entirely, so help me God, I will throw all my toys in the trash. I'm still mad that that HasLab Black Series Rancor toy didn't get funded. But I digress. Brass tax time, Boba Fett has spent a lot of time in this show just kind of strolling around Mos Espa telling everybody that he's the daimyo without really ever actually doing anything to legitimize his claim. Riding up on a Rancor to kick off a fight against the Pikes could be just the thing he needs to save his image here. On top of giving Boba the Rancor, the Huts also tell him he can do whatever he wants with Black Chrysanthemum, who Boba just sets free. So Chrysanthemum is out there, but will this act inspire any trust in Boba Fett or is he just gonna bounce entirely?
And just like with episodes one and two, there's a good portion of episode three that takes place in a flashback. This time we see Boba ride a Bantha into Mos Eisley to shake down the Pikes following last episode's spice heist. He offers them protection from his new gang of Tusken Raider friends, but they say they're already paying the Nikto speeder bike gang for that, and they're not about to pay double. So Boba heads back to his Tusken village under the Tusken sons and finds his new family of gun mummies brutally murdered, and those rotten Nikto swoop jockeys have left their calling card. So, so much for Boba going full Muad'Dib and becoming the leader of an army of freemen, or whatever you thought was going to happen because you saw Dune. And look, it's sad, but it's also not the first time that the Tuscans have been sacrificed for the sake of someone else's character development. <laughs> Anyway, back in present day, Boba's cycloptic cyborg lookout, who IMDb IDs as SCAD, spots scads of pikes getting off a cruiser in Mos Espa, so this episode leaves off with Boba on the brink of major gang war in not one, but two timelines. He's got to exact revenge on the speeder bike gang for killing his adopted clan in the past, and then he's got to get these pikes to take a hike so he can actually be the Tatooine crime lord that he's telling everyone that he is. And of course, now it's time for the Easter eggs that we spotted this week. Here's what we got. The Pikes featured heavily in Darth Maul's Shadow Collective and the Clone Wars, and they appear in Solo as the guys running the spice mines of Kessel. That little Bomar monk we saw in the trailer shows up here in the exact same establishing shot. The Bomar monks were, of course, the original owners of Jabba's palace, according to Expanded Universe slash Legends lore, and they're not just little spider droids. The religious order was all about freeing themselves of earthly possessions so much that they would relinquish their own organic bodies and live out the rest of their lives as brains in jars, which would occasionally take little walks in the spider bodies like this one. Hey, do you guys miss young Boba Fett like I do? Yep. Yeah, I thought so. Which is great because once again, young Boba Fett makes some flashback appearances in this episode, played by Daniel Logan and de-aged using the power of computers. In that flashback, we see young Boba watching his dear old dad Django fly away from the Kamino landing platforms in his Fire Spray 31 class patrol at attack craft, which no longer has an official name. And it's cool to see the cloning headquarters again in a flashback here. Kamino factored pretty heavily into the Bad Batch season one, including the destruction of the whole dang facility once the newly formed empire stole all of their cloning tech and burned everything else down, which is probably pretty ambitious on a water planet. How do you start a fire there? It's always wet. Okay, so Jesse Gill, the writer and producer of this particular program, is obsessed with Star Wars and also frogs and toads for some reason. Anyway, he almost lost his shit again this week when a wart showed up. We first saw a wart being as space frog as possible in this Return of the Jedi establishing shot, and we see one the same way here after watching the Tuscans senselessly murder one in the Book of Boba Fett episode two. Moment of silence for the space frog, please. And also, we want more space frogs next episode. When Boba's entering Moss Eisley, a woman walks by in the background, trailed by three pit droids, and it's a safe bet that that's Peli Motto, the mechanic played by Amy Sedaris in The Mandalorian. When Boba tells Danny Trejo he's ridden much larger beasts than a Rancor, he was talking about your mother. I'm just kidding. This was probably a nod to the very first appearance of Boba Fett on the Star Wars Holiday Special when he rode around on a big Pars Ichthyodont, which he kept whacking over the head with a phase pulse blaster rifle, like the one that Mando carries. And that's about everything we spotted this episode. Dank Ferrick. Hey, watch it, language. You kiss your crime lord with that mouth? Actually, don't answer that. Dank Ferrick is, of course, the new in-universe Star Wars swear word, which we absolutely need more of. Ichuta. This guy gets it. Anyway, what did you think of this episode and what Easter eggs did you spot that we missed? Also, is Boba Fett eventually going to have to prove he's a tough guy that he pretends to be? Or is he maybe not cut out for all this crime lord stuff and should just go back to bounty hunting? Let's hear what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Cannon Fodder. For more on Star Wars, check out everything new coming from the galaxy far, far away in 2022. And remember to follow and subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch. May the Force be with you. This is the way. And no disintegrations, please.